Ah, hello there. Welcome back. Just a few moments, we're going to start reading chapter 5. Before we do that, it's been brought to my attention that maybe my videos are too dull for middle schoolers. So, one thing I did was I created a five things I like to do during quarantine list. Check these out. video more exciting? Well, if it didn't, one thing that might in this chapter is video games. That's right. In this chapter, two of the main characters are really good at playing video games. Um, another thing that it talks about in this chapter are rumors, which is something that I have found can be pretty common in middle school. Students spreading lies about other students to try to make them feel maybe ashamed, nervous, scared. So, that's kind of what this chapter is about. Rumors and how they affect people. Alright, chapter 5 is called Berman Street. And then the subtitle, Call of Duty. Bryson Wills didn't go to school today. His mother let him stay home, not because of all the pain in his face, the black eye, the busted lip, the swollen jaw, the scrapes, but because she figured it was a good idea to let things cool off, to put some space between him and what happened, to let the situation breathe. Before she left the house, she told Bryson a bunch of things, that she loved him and was proud of him, but most importantly, that he shouldn't play video games all day. Bryson's father came in his room after his mom and told him the same things, minus the part about video games. Love you, Bry, his dad said, kissing him on the cheek over and over again like he did every morning, until Bryson grunted something that his father translated as, love you too. Then Bryson rolled over, his plush mattress suddenly prickly like a bed of nails against his bruised body. A few hours later, Bryson was awake, standing, yawning, stretching, all of which felt like he was pulling himself apart. He eased down into the hall, into the kitchen, microwaved a bowl of oatmeal, poured a glass of apple juice, then sat in front of the TV, where, even though his mother said not to, he'd planned to play video games all day. He didn't want to think about school, or after school, the walk home, none of it. But he couldn't help it. The thoughts were like the smell of coffee that seemed to linger in the house long after it had been brewed. Bryson chewed his lumpy oatmeal slowly, choked it down, replaying the scene. The moment that landed him there with a the body on fire, the punches thrown, the kicks kicked, everybody's phones out, recording. He'd seen the clips all over social media the night before. Commentary, filters, memes, hashtags. Hashtag Berman Street Beatdown. The shaky footage of him throwing haymakers, trying not to fall. Because once you fall, it's over. Everyone knows that. Ain't no getting up, ain't no coming back. He signed out, then signed back then. 
They deleted all of the apps from his phone, at least for a few days. He wouldn't have, uh, he wouldn't have been able to, but his mom made him. Made him unplug from the laughs and the likes, from the catchy captions and antics from kids who barely spoke in school but had mastered saying the right things online. Matched with the perfect light and angle to turn out of this world boredom into an Oscar worthy blockbuster. And now Bryson was sitting alone on the living room floor, trying to swallow sludgy oats and forget it all. By going to war. The television glowed. Call of Duty. Xbox powered on. Headset on. Controller gripped. As Bryson Wills crawled into World War II. So, so far we can tell that there's been a fight. Okay? Now what this chapter is going to do next is it's going to go in a time machine and go back to when this fight happened and explain why it happened. All right, so we're at the top of page 93 here. Ty Carson went to school today, and the whole time he was there, he felt like he was being watched, stared at, even though the new rumor had taken over yesterday's old one. Because rumors only last a day. But still, Ty felt like his classmates were following him. Not stalking him, peeping around corners and things like that. No, but more like looking away whenever he'd catch their eyes. Or cutting their conversations whenever he walked by. Like he was some kind of human mute button. Made him paranoid. So paranoid, he even felt like every clock was actually a giant eye. And every time the bell rang, he imagined it was the building laughing at him. He was losing it and wished he could make himself small, unseeable. Turn himself into a speck, into a black streak swiped across the floor from a sneaker sole. Turn himself into a penny swept into one of the corners by Mr. Munch's big broom. But he couldn't do none of that, so he shrank mentally, tried to crawl inside himself. Another thing he wished he could really do be like a turtle. Pull his head into the home of his body. Look around the shell. Try to figure out why he felt how he felt. Why he did what he did. Which was nothing but felt like something. Yesterday. Figure out if it was wrong. It wasn't wrong. But maybe it was. He didn't know and that was the hard part. Or at least part of the hard part about yesterday. Not just yesterday. But yesterday, too. Yesterday when everything was fine. Yesterday when he could just be Ty. Ty was cool enough to be cool with everybody because most people looked at him like a human video game. Bright, full of color and sound, awkward movements, dramatic moments. He lived in his own world, but it was a world full of windows that everyone could see into. A world full of bloops and bleeps and vrooms and the occasional boom. It wasn't strange to see him pretending to crawl up the lockers or for him to perform tactical movements like barrel rolls in the middle of the hallway. The type of kid who wore his backpack on the front of his body. A chest pack. Just so he could pretend it was some type of armor. And on any given day an umbrella could become either sword or shotgun. And to top it all off, Ty was one of the best gamers around, nationally ranked, and everybody knew. He'd won tournaments and competitions and been trying to get Mr. Walkley to convince Mr. Jarrett to start a gaming league at school. We don't need more distractions, Mr. Carson. She, oh. We don't need no more distractions, Mr. Carson, she'd say, biting down hard on her words. Bleep, 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 bloop, Miss Walkley, he'd reply. He'd shake his head and she'd shake hers, and that would be that. Because everyone knew Ty's gaming skills, his classmates were always trying to convince him to play on their squads. But Ty only played with the best. Well, he was the best, so the second best. And at their school, the second best was Bryson Willis, a boy whose father made him grow out his hair, and instead of letting him get it braided or cornrowed, convinced him that Afro was the best way to go. 
and Bryson owned it. He owned it so much that his screen name was Afro Gamer. Ties was tired, which he said was pronounced tired because he was so tired of beating everyone. But most gamers thought it was Ty Red, which made sense too because Ty saw red whenever he was playing. All instinct, all thumbs. Bryson and Ty lived close enough to each other to get together on weekends of play. Sometimes, Bryson would come into Ty's house, a small house over on Crossman. Bryson liked this because Miss Cece's, the world's best candy lady, lived at the top of Ty's street. And other times, Ty would come over to Bryson's house, a bigger house over on Berman. Ty preferred to play at Bryson's. The snacks were better. The TV was bigger, and a tiny dog named Max Payne wasn't running around barking and clawing at it. The game of choice? Call of Duty World War II, which really bothered his parents. Pac-Man! Now that's a game. You just eat and run away from ghosts, which is what I like to call life, his father said, joking. Or, or Super Mario, his mother added. I mean, other than fighting the big bosses, you're basically just trying not to be eaten by the environment. Mushrooms and plants and, and turtles, his father yipped. It's nothing like what you're playing. Ty tried to convince his parents Call of Duty was educational. That it was basically like interactive social studies class. That there was no better way to learn about the particular way war than to jump right into it. There is no way you can know about war, son, Ty's mother scolded. Not unless you fought at one, and you haven't. You're talking about Nazis. That's a lot more than some video game. Ty understood that he didn't know the kind of war he was simulating in the game. That his controller wasn't a rifle, and his raggedy family reunion t-shirt wasn't a flak jacket. His headset wasn't a helmet and the sounds in his ears were, in fact, just sounds in his ears. But Ty also knew that there was some kind of war he was in. Some kind of battle he didn't know, but couldn't make, he did know, but couldn't make sense of. That the other sounds in his head were more than just sounds. That they made his heart do weird things, made his stomach tighten. Ty knew the anxiety of a kind of war. He knew the adrenaline and confusion of it all. Because yesterday, because yesterday, because yesterday, Ty had been kissed by a boy, Slim, at the water fountain after first period, P.E., on his cheek, but close enough to his mouth to count. They were fighting over the water. We were fighting over the water, right? It was weird. He was surprised, but not mad, which was more surprising. It was so weird. It wasn't that weird. It was a little weird, but not a whole lot weird. It was seen by someone. No one saw see it. And that someone told everyone. Everyone. And by lunch, Slim whose real name was Salem, had twisted the story, told everyone that Ty kissed him. So when Ty walked into the cafeteria, he walked into a minefield, a war zone. Everyone locked and loaded, firing at him. Bryson had heard the rumor. It snaked around, passed from mouth to ear, a hiss whisper. It eventually came to Bryson through Remy Vaughn, if Remy didn't try to act cool, he probably would have been the coolest kid in school. But, nope. So? Bryson shot back, slamming his locker door. So, that mean he gay? No, it don't, Bryson said, annoyed. And even if it do, so what? Bryson swung his backpack onto his shoulder, watching Remy's face, trying to work out why he cared so much about tying Slim. So Bryson asked him, Why do you care so much? I don't. You do. I mean, here's a better question. How many girls have you kissed? I, I don't know, a bunch, Remy said, looking off. 
Bryson knew that was a lie, and he hadn't kissed anyone. And Bryson didn't hold that against him, because he hadn't kissed anyone either. But he never lied about it. It was no big deal. Plus, why lie to a person you know knows the truth? Remy's best friend Candace was Bryson's cousin, and she was always going on and on about how Remy was forever acting like some kind of lover boy that no one's ever loved. Right. A bunch. I guess negative numbers are still numbers, Bryson Raz. I just think it might be best to mind your business. He patted Remy on the shoulder and walked away. In the cafeteria, instead of people leaving Ty alone, instead of them cracking their stupid jokes to each other, a bunch of them had decided to sit with him, crowd around him at the lunch table, tease him to his face, including Slim. By the time Bryson got there, they were calling Ty all kinds of names. Names that bite, names that stick and mark, names that catch fire and leave a burnt smell in the air. The boys mocked him, bending their wrists as if they'd just shot a basketball and were holding the follow-through. Holding, holding. Yo, what's going on? Bryson asked, coming up to the table. He stood behind Ty, his hair like an eclipsed sun. Scoot over, Ty, let me slide in. Ty inched to the left and Bryson sat next to him. Set his tray of mozzarella sticks on the table. What's everyone talking about? Oh, nothing, Slim said. Just that Ty tried to kiss me because he's gay. He said it like it was a your mama joke, like he just chopped Ty down. Ty shook his head like it didn't matter, but Bryson could tell it did. It for sure did. Hmm, interesting, Bryson said, looking down at the fried cheese fingers on his tray, because I heard you kissed him. He glanced up at Slim. Because that's true, Ty confirmed, relieved that Bryson was there. His back up, just like in the game. Watch my back! Cover me! Cover me! That ain't true, Slim barked, looking around to make sure everyone heard him. I wouldn't kiss no boy! Hey, 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 man, Bryson put his hands up. If you did, you did. It's all good. I mean, you might want to ask permission next time instead of just sneaking it. That's a little weird, but relax. The other guys at the table didn't know if they should laugh or oh or nod or what. They couldn't tell if Bryson was being serious or if he was just joking around. You're talking like you like boys too. Trey Larson, a fake tough guy who everyone know got chumped by the smallest kid in the school said to Bryson. Bryson started laughing. Am I? I think Slim is. Matter of fact, I think y'all all are. Bryson pointed at all the jokesters. Like my father always says, those that scar you are you. He checked their faces, and it wasn't hard to tell that they had no idea what that meant. He looked at Ty, and Ty's face looked no different. A gem dropped in the mud. The point is, I don't like boys. Not like that, but I like Ty. He patted Ty on the back. Matter of fact, I like him more than I like y'all. And for real, for real, I don't see what the big deal is. A kiss on the cheek? That's what y'all are roasting him for? A kiss on the cheek? Really? Bryson looked at Slim, held his eyes there for a while before looking at the other guys. That's it? And then, Bryson leaned over and pecked Ty on the cheek. Mwah! And all. Then he put his eyes right back on Slim. Look at that. I'm still alive. He made his voice sound ghostly, shrugged, and then ate a mozzarella stick. The table fell silent. Well, at least to Bryson and Ty. They wouldn't have known if the other boys actually stopped talking and joking because they were no longer paying attention. But attention would be paid, and it would be paid to Bryson. Because for the remainder of the afternoon, the rumor had become different. It had transformed, switching from Ty kissing Slim to Bryson kissing Ty. The mighty snake of gossip going from a harmless garter to a venomous python. Bryson did his best to ignore it all, to think about it as a stage in a game, 
a board beaten only by making it to the end of the day bell. But as soon as that bell rang and Bryson left school, he noticed that Slim and some of the other boys were following him down Portal Avenue. Bryson knew they were trailing him because he'd never seen them walk this way before and was pretty sure that they didn't live on this side of the neighborhood. He could hear them laughing, hear them yelling things, and even though he couldn't make out what they were yelling, he could still feel the sounds of their voices pricking him like staples in the back. As soon as he turned down Berman Street, Bryson could hear their feet quicken, hear the footfalls on the pavement speed up like rain going from drizzle to downpour. And instead of running, Bryson just turned around, put his hands up, and did his best. That was yesterday, and today, at school, Ty heard the whispers. The python had become a boa, strangling him, wrapped all around his body, squeezing him, squeezing, crushing his lungs and heart. The whispers did nothing but confirm what he'd already known, what he'd already seen online the night before. The rumors that Slim and Andrew and whoever else they were with had jumped Byron. That Byron had held his own as best as he could. But then there were four of them. And they were calling him everything but his name. So in Mr. Devonzo's class at the end of the day, when the bell rang, Ty ran. He ran out of class. He ran down the corridor. He ran through the double doors. He ran past Miss Post. He ran down Portal Avenue as fast as he could for as long as he could until he was out of breath. Then he walked fast and stopped only when he got to a house a few blocks from Berman Street, a big beige colored house with a big window, beautiful green grass and shrubs that outlined the yard, accented by two large rose bushes. He looked around to the left, to the right, behind him, in front of him. Then he jammed his hand into the bush and snatched a fistful of roses, the thorns needling into his fingers and palm. Hurt, but he ran. He ran and ran, on and on. Left on Berman, down Berman, left at Bryson's, which looked like nothing, which looked nothing like the houses on Portal Avenue. No big window, no shrubs or hedges, no driveway. A metal chain link fence that opened onto a walkway that led to the front door. All right, so we're back to the day where Bryson stays at home. Ty is talking about, or Ty is thinking about all that's going on at school. He's hearing all these rumors, and then finally at the end of the day, he decides, I'm going to run out of the class as fast as I can, run down the street, and go to Bryson's house. So we just left off where he's going to walk up the walkway to the front door. If Bryson hadn't paused the game to make himself a bologna sandwich, he wouldn't have heard the doorbell. He'd been playing Call of Duty all day, fighting against computerized versions of Nazis and doing everything he could, mission after mission, to not get himself killed along the way. His headset had been on since just after the morning oatmeal, his world of school rumors were placed by bombs in his ear. His hands were sore from yesterday, but that didn't stop him from thumbing the controller all day, even though his mother had warned him, told him it might be better if he'd read a book instead. Might be easier to hold a story than to hold a controller, son, she'd said, knowing Bryson wouldn't listen. At least feed yourself, she'd added, giving up before closing his bedroom door and leaving for work. And Bryson was doing just that, feeding himself for the second time, when the, doorbell, when the doorbell rang. Bryson shuffled his way over to the door, his body still feeling like garbled pixels. He looked through the peephole like his father had taught him, unlocked the deadbolt, turned the knob, and pulled the door open. Ty? Ty stood there, breathing heavy, holding three or four roses. It was hard to tell exactly how many because they were mangled. The human video game seemed to glitch in red streaks. The same red as the petals of the flowers was dripping from his shaking palm. 
you okay, man? Yeah, Ty wheezed, his back aching as if a school bus had fallen from the sky and landed right on him. Yeah, I'm okay. Are you okay? Yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'll, I'll be fine. Ty nodded. Playing the game? He asked, trying to figure out how to make it less awkward. Been fighting the war all day, bro. Bryson smirked, wiggling his thumbs. His eyes skipped from Ty's face to his shredded hand. Ty nodded again. Well, uh, uh, I, I brought these for you. He held the roses out. You ain't have to do that, Bryson said. Ty nodded a third time. His eyes started to puff up and slick over. The rock in his throat began to roll. There were things they needed to talk about. Things they didn't need to talk about. There was a lot to say, but nothing that needed to be said. Bryson carefully took the flowers, smelled them like he'd seen his mother do. They made his nose itch. Hey man, we better wash that blood off your hand, Bryson said, opening the door wide. And Ty nodded once more. Okay, so that's it for chapter five. Um, as you can see, those two friends, Bryson and Ty, it seems like there's something going on between them that they have yet to discuss. Um, but what I'd like you to do is make sure you're answering the questions on Schoology that are posted for chapter five. Uh, chapter six will be posted soon. Thanks.